Hello, my name is Cole Anderson. Welcome back to my channel about piano playing and piano repertoire. Today we're talking about a really interesting piece, Arantavara's Etudes Opus 42. Before we dive in, please do consider supporting this channel if you like my content. You can do so by becoming a patron on patreon.com. The address for that is www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. Or if you don't want to become a regular patron of the channel, you can also make a one-time donation through PayPal. So I have my link for PayPal in the description box below. Thank you for your support. It'll really just help me to keep bringing you quality content every week. I post every Friday. Eno Johanni Rautavara was a remarkable musical figure, a composer with a powerful and individual voice. He was really probably the most important Finnish composer after Sibelius during the 20th and early 21st centuries. Earlier in his career, he experimented with serialism as well, but later on he developed his own kind of uh, freely influenced neo-romantic style that is very beautiful and original. These etudes date from 1969, which was right as Rautavara was on the cusp of really synthesizing his various influences and forging his own style. The full set of etudes, number six, of which I've selected my favorite three for today's video. You'll notice that each etude's title is a musical interval, so in my case, this is thirds, seconds, and fourths. Each etude is obviously based on its interval. However, Rautavar does not go about writing an etude in thirds, for example, in the same way that a 19th century composer like Chopin did. But just to take Chopin as an example, when he wrote his great etude in thirds, opus 25, number 6, he was writing a great musical work that happened to focus on the technical difficulty inherent in playing thirds with one hand alone. Well, Rautavara's approach is quite different. Instead, he takes the basic idea of an interval, like a third, and extrapolates it to create his musical texture. So in this etude, we get thirds as a harmonic device, one third stacked on top of another to form all kinds of harmonic combinations. These end up being quite kaleidoscopic and indeed are beautiful examples of bitonality. So bitonality is the overlaying of two different, seemingly irreconcilable harmonies irreconcilable only in the light of standard harmonic practice, however. So in this piece, you hear conglomerations like this chord that opens the piece. This is a D major triad in the left hand, overlaid with an F major seventh chord in the right hand, which is not too crazy, although the F sharp and the F natural create a nice little twang. And later on there are many more lovely combinations like this chord. Also at the end of the piece it may be the case that Rontavara is tipping his hat to Igor Stravinsky a little bit. He uses Stravinsky's famous Petrushka chord as the last sonority of the piece. The Petrushka chord of course is a uh, two chords a tritone apart superimposed. So C major and F sharp major in this case.
Next, I play seconds. Uh, the second, of course, is the smallest possible interval between two notes. And it seems almost as though Rautavara is acknowledging this in the way he writes the piece. It has a claustrophobic, suffocated kind of feeling. All the melodic lines always return to the interval of a second. That is constantly continuing in ostinato in the middle of the keyboard. This piece, along with fourths, is also a wonderful example of a kind of pianistic compositional technique called symmetrical inversion. This idea derives from the realization that the keyboard is actually directly symmetrical in construction around two points, A flat and D. shape that moves upwards can be exactly mirrored in its pattern of white and black notes moving downwards. For example, if you take a scale, say the scale of A major, and then add a symmetrically inverted line below it, you get a very fascinating example of bitonality. There are several places I've marked in the music where Rantavara uses this exact technique to marvelous effect. Just as a side note as well, this is a very useful practice technique also for developing ease and relaxation, as well as evening up the scale of the right and left hands to a certain extent. Any difficult passage in one hand can be inverted into the other hand. Symmetrical inversion pretty much removes any difficulty related to coordination of the hands. Coordinating the left and right hands to do very different things always brings with it a certain amount of physical tension, which can get in the way of conquering purely mechanical difficulties. Oftentimes people practice hands alone to get around this, but that actually puts a lot of strain on each hand by itself, which can be useful in its own way. But with symmetrical inversion, with both hands kind of helping each other, it really creates a feeling of great relaxation and ease. It certainly will not solve all technical problems, but I found that working on technical patterns in symmetrical inversion can do wonders for releasing unwanted tension, particularly as relates to uh, chords, octaves, staccato passages, and the like.
And lastly, we have the interval of a fourth. The perfect fourth interval is of an open and spacious nature, and the music is appropriately grand and spacious in conception. Most of the piece consists of chords that are usually termed in popular harmony as sus4 chords, like this. This chord has an intrinsically dissonant quality. There's a feeling of wanting to resolve the fourth down to the third. Another source of tension in this piece, however, is the use of the augmented fourth as well, also known as the tritone, which plays a big part in the climax of this etude. For centuries, this interval, of course, was avoided by superstitious composers who felt that it represented the presence of the devil in music.